Good evening, everyone. This is Don. Thank you for joining this webinar brought to you by ASQ Innovation Division. The topic of tonight's webinar is sustaining change. Are you asking the wrong questions? Making a change is often very easy. Ensuring that change stays in place is very frequently run into issues. When changes slip away, we lose the benefits those changes were meant to bring, as well as the resources it took to make those changes in the first place. This session will reframe the questions we ask when attempting to sustain changes and refocus where sustaining action emphasis should be put. Methods will also be explained that help select and prioritize the best sustaining actions so that the benefits of changes can be enjoyed for a long time to come. The learning objectives are be able to recognize the wrong questions to ask when trying to sustain a change, be able to prioritize sustaining actions based on a bad, good, better, best hierarchy, be able to critique your own sustainment plan. Please note that this webinar is recorded and the recording will be available on ASQ Innovation Division YouTube channel. Also, there will be five to 10 minutes time after the presentation for questions and answers. Please post your questions on the Q&A section of the WebEx tool. Tonight, our presenter is Mr. Sean Perkins. Thank you, Sean, again, for accepting to be our speaker. Sean Perkins is a senior member of the ASQ from the state of Kentucky with certification as a Six Sigma Black Belt and Quality Auditor. He holds a degree in chemistry from Moray State University and a graduate certificate in applied statistical strategies from the University of Tennessee. Sean currently works for the Colorex company as the corporate improvement methods pillar owner. While currently focused in the area of manufacturing for work, Sean loves the concepts of quality and continuous improvement because of their application to all areas of life, and he's proud to be going through his life journeys with his wife of more than 20 years, Debbie, and his two children, Amanda and Eric. Now I'd like to hand over to Sean Perkins. Sean, please take it away. All right, thank you, and good evening to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to the, the innovation group here uh, from uh, from ASQ. You know, whenever I think about innovation, a couple of different things come to mind. The first of those is an innovative new product. Uh, you know, we've got had some great innovative new products here in the, the last number of years uh, that have made some, some big step changes. Uh, you know, all the, the new electronics and robotics uh, and the, the all the, the digital uh, items that we have now, all you know, making things move uh, move in a uh, uh, what seems to be a good direction. Uh, additionally, when I think innovation, the other thing that that comes to mind actually is about the innovation of the processes that are used to manufacture those products, or innovation inside of how you deliver a service. So that's gonna be more of the focus that we're gonna be going into uh, this evening, is what, how do you sustain those changes whenever you innovate a manufacturing process, or whenever you innovate and make a change to a, a service that's being provided, a people process. So the objectives here, is that we are going to prioritize sustaining actions to help ensure that that sustainment uh, is going to, to hang around and hey, potentially even avoid some unnecessary work. Sometimes we make some, some extra uh, work on ourselves that doesn't really need to be done. Uh, and the better prioritizing methods that you choose, the less work that you're going to have to do. We are also going to talk about learning to choose the best sustaining steps for the type of change that's being made, and also show you a, a way that you can critique your sustainment plan uh, using a simple process input and output uh, diagram. So just a little bit about me so that I'm not just some voice coming at you over the, over the computer or over your phone line. Uh, I am Sean Perkins, and 
Uh, the picture there in the, the upper left is me and my wife, Debbie, and then my son, Eric, and my daughter, Amanda. And we have to be there at the uh, the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, that was actually where the ASQ World Conference was held uh, just a, a few years ago. And this particular presentation that I'm going to be giving to you, I actually uh, gave in Seattle this past year at the World Conference on Quality and Improvement. So this was one of the, the basic sessions uh, that was done during the concurrent session time and uh, seemed to be uh, pretty well received. Uh, I do live in Kentucky and we have a log home here that uh, I just think is, is wonderful. We, it's, it's beautiful, especially around Christmas time uh, with all the snow and uh, the, the trees around us. Now, I am a Star Wars fan also. And I, when I was younger, I loved the movies, had a lot of the, the toys. And so whenever the Disney park started offering up the, uh, the Star Wars running races, the, the half marathons and the 10Ks, I, I was really stoked at that because I'm, I run also. I'm not a competitive runner, but I do run. So when I had the, the chance to mix running and Star Wars together, that just, that just made my day. And then on the very right-hand side, you see our dog, Pepper. She's a bit of a, a camera hound posing for the camera there. And lastly, I do work for the Clorox company. You see a number of the products that Clorox makes there at the very bottom of the screen. Everything from Kingsford charcoal to Hidden Valley Ranch salad dressing, Glad bags, Formula 409 cleaners, a soy vey sauces. And so we have a lot of different things under the, the Clorox company umbrella. Not everything is just bleach. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's just what we happen to be uh, be known for mostly, just from the name, the Clorox, uh, the Clorox company. Now, when I first started in my role as the Improvement Methods pillar owner, I did some some quick travels around to a handful of our manufacturing sites, and it was it was really it was it was really interesting and really enlightening. Going back even farther though. Whenever I first joined the company, I was uh, really eager because I joined as the quality manager for a Kingsford charcoal plant located in Summershade, Kentucky. And I was really eager and excited about what Clorox was doing within the quality realm because the company I'd come from previously, the, the quality role that I had there, I was always a little iffy about it. I was always, it, something just didn't set right with me about how they were handling quality at this, uh, this company that I was working at previously. See, the quality group there would seem more as the quality police. The, the, the company would have you go out and hold product and disposition product and rework product. And that was basically what the, the quality group did. Uh, and they would spend thousands and thousands of dollars installing capital equipment so that they could rework product faster and better. They would install chutes and conveyors and dump back stations so that they could dump back product and blend back product faster and better. And it just never did set right with me that they would spend all that money on sweeping the problem under the rug about reworking that product. But they would never stop and ask the question, why did that quality problem happen in the first place? And what can we do about it so that it does not happen again in the future? When I started with Clorox as the quality manager at the charcoal plant in Summershade, I especially liked the fact that they were asking some of those questions. They were looking at the charcoal briquettes that were being made and asking, how do we make them so that they burn faster? burn sorry, light faster and burn longer. How do we make it so that the briquettes, what can we do to the formula so that the briquettes hold together better in the bag and you don't have a bag full of uh, crumbled up briquettes? So they were asking those questions about the common quality problems that will pop up and were making changes to eliminate those. So I very much respected what Clorox was doing in that regard. And then comes the first site visit that I had when I joined the uh, the continuous improvement group. Uh, one of the sites that I, I went to was a GLAD manufacturing plant. They make they manufacture GLAD bags, like garbage bags and sandwich bags. And so I did a, a plant tour in, in our plant in Rogers, Arkansas. Now, usually when you go on these tours, you get the, uh, the tour where somebody takes you around and shows you some of the things they've been working on. And they were wanting to showcase some of the continuous improvement work that they had been doing up to that point. 
So the gentleman that was taking me around took me to a piece of equipment, and he told me, we as we were walking up to the to the line, we've installed this new rail that eliminates a certain type of case jam that they were experiencing at the end of the, the packaging line. As we walked up there, he was pointing over to where the rail was supposed to be, and he couldn't find it. He was looking and looking, and he said, well, the rail was supposed to be there. He looked over, and the rail was actually had been taken off the line and was sitting unceremoniously in the corner, uh, off to itself, not uh, being used for its intended purpose. We then walked over to another packaging line where they take large rolls of plastic and then convert those into the, the garbage bags uh, for, uh, for going on through the, the rest of the, the conveyors. As we walk over to the, uh, the machine that was running the large rolls of plastic, he told me that these rolls of plastic have to be changed out. As they, as they unwind and they get down to the core, they have to change out and put another new roll on to keep the, the line running. And he told me, okay, as the person makes this changeover, they're going to do it this specific way. And we watched him do it, and he did not do it that way. And he looked at me. I could almost see a tear in his eye. He looked at me and, and said, well, he was supposed to have done it that way. And so in a matter of just a few minutes, you know, in, in just that one plant tour, I saw how quickly good continuous improvement efforts can go wrong when the physical changes to a piece of equipment or the new procedure that was implemented is not maintained. And so that's why this particular topic is really near and dear to my heart, because this was one of the very first issues that I ran into. We've put a lot of good effort into making some good improvements to the processes that we have, and then we revert back to the old ways before those changes were, were put into place. So as we progress through the, the presentation here, uh, to begin with, I need to convince you of, of three things in order to really be effective. Uh, with with the, the topic that we're covering on on sustaining change, uh, the first of which is uh, I have to convince you number one that change is happening and change, there's a lot of change happening, so it's going to be in our best interest to sustain the changes that we want to keep. So read the two questions here, and I want you to to think think about the answer. So in the late 1800s, how long did it take? For there to reach, for them to reach 50 million users of the telephone when the telephone was first coming out, and then here more recently in, in 2009, how long did it take to reach 50 million users of the app of the game Angry Birds? I'll give you just a few seconds to think about that. How long did it take to reach 50 million users of the telephone in the late 1800s, and then part two? 50 million users of the Angry Birds app in 2009. It's, it's really, the answer is really eye-opening. So back when the telephone was first coming out in the 1800s, it took 75 years for the telephone to reach 50 million users. And this particular chart here, as you go down, you can see how things have sped up. The radio, 38 years. Television, 13 years. The Internet, World Wide Web, four years. Facebook, three and a half. The iPod, three. And then jumping down there to the very bottom, you see Angry Birds, taking 35 days to reach 50 million users. The telephone, 75 years. Angry Birds app, 35 days. So this is just to tell you, change is happening faster and faster. So that was point one. The second is I have to convince you that if change is not sustained, that that is a bad thing. So if we think about it, to me, this one's a bit more of a, a no-brainer. Whenever we make a change, whenever we innovate something within our process or within the services that we're delivering, we want that change to stay, stay in place because we put those changes in place for a reason. Typically, we were eliminating some other problem. We were eliminating some other waste or loss or issue, whatever word you want to throw in there. 
we were eliminating something bad that was going on. That's why we made these changes uh, in the first place. So if that change is undone, if that countermeasure that we implemented is taken out of place, number one, the problem is going to come back. We've wasted the resources that we put to solving that problem the first time. And lastly, we're going to have to resolve that same problem again in the future, or we're just going to have to deal with it uh, on an ongoing basis. And so whenever we do this continuous improvement and we go back and we see that the rail has been taken off the line or we see that the person doesn't do the procedure the way that they're supposed to, many times we feel like we're drowning. We just throw up our hand and say, okay, well, at least I tried. Well, what we're suggesting is that we need to do a little bit more than, than just try to make that change. We need to make some conceded efforts to sustain that change. We cannot expect a person to go out there and make a change and expect it to stay in place. You actually have to make efforts to ensure that it stays in place. And so it's not, it's a, it's not just a, a try. There is a go do something to ensure that it, that it does stay there. And so lastly, the third thing here to convince you that this, this topic is worthwhile, uh, if you experience any of these issues, then it's really happening to you. So could this really happen to you? Well, if you've experienced any of these, then, then yes, it has. So why change is not sustained? So maybe there was another problem that popped up. Whenever you made a change, there was something else that popped up, and so that change had to be undone. They intentionally chose to undo that, that problem. Maybe there's a communication lapse and a person on another shift didn't know what this new thing was, and so rather than run with this new thing that they're not familiar with, they take it off. They undo that change. Maybe there's been training lapses similar to the communication lapses in that certain procedures are not trained on, so folks don't know that it's supposed to be done in a new, a new way. And then lastly, those equipment and process changes are, are in, like I said, intentionally uh, undone. Uh, so basically, we're, we're trying to move us towards do or do not, you know, there is no try. We don't want to just try to implement a countermeasure. We want to implement that countermeasure and then do something to ensure that that is fully sustained. So another quick question for you. We want you to, to fill in the blank here. Whenever you think about continuous improvement efforts that, that you may have done, changes that you've made, innovations that you've made, you may ask this question, how do we sustain the blank? So think, how would you fill in, what word, phrase, expression would you fill in the blank with? Give just a few seconds there. How do we sustain the blank? So now that you've got your answers in your head, I'm going to go to two of the most common words that get put into that, uh, that blank, and those would be change and improvement. How do we sustain the change? How do we sustain, sustain the improvement? And this is what I'm going to say is one of the, these are a couple of the wrong questions to be, to be asking. See, words mean things. Unfortunately, the word change and the word improvement can mean lots of different things. So whenever leadership, whenever supervisors ask the question, how do we sustain the change? Or how do we sustain the improvement? Many times, their minds are on the results, the outputs, the metrics that are being generated via the processes and services that are, are being, uh, being delivered. So their minds are on the outputs. So when they say change and improvement, they're thinking on the output side of things. But the person who did the continuous improvement made changes to the process itself, or they made changes to the inputs to that process. So the question here becomes, where is the focus? And where should the focus be? See, the supervisors and the leadership typically are asking about the output. They're asking about that metric, the result. Even if they're saying change or improvement, their focus is on the output. To the person who runs the equipment, to the person who does the process, 
they see the changes, the countermeasures that were implemented within the inputs and the processes themselves that generate the output. The countermeasures were put in place to ensure this new and better output is, is being generated, but you have to sustain these inputs and processes in their new state with that new improvement, that new uh, countermeasure in place. Otherwise, the outputs are going to slip back to the old ways. See, it's really easy whenever leadership or supervisors come to uh, an operator or come to a person who's actually doing the, uh, the, the work or the service or running the equipment. It's really easy when they ask about, hey, how are the results? How are the output? How are the efficiencies? How are the cost savings? All those are the outputs. It's really easy then for the people running the lines, running the processes, to then focus their efforts on just the outputs. And they're not maintaining the health of the inputs and the processes themselves. So what I'm suggesting is that how do we sustain the improvement and how do we sustain the change are too general. I'm also suggesting that another wrong question is, how do we sustain the result? Now, it's not necessarily bad that we're looking at the results. We want to know if we're having a good benefit from the changes that are made. But if we're really talking about sustaining that result, if you really want to sustain that result, you have to sustain the process and the inputs to that process that are generating the result. So you should be asking the question, how do we sustain the countermeasures? How do we make sure that those countermeasures remain in place and do not go away? As long as the countermeasures remain in place, the benefits you get from those countermeasures will also remain in place. So we found three questions so far. How do we sustain the improvement? How do we sustain the change? And how do we sustain the result? All those are not the best questions to be asking when we're trying to really sustain, when we're, what we really want to sustain is the countermeasure. Whenever we have a, a problem that, uh, that we're solving, there's a certain flow that we usually go through. We've, we first recognize that there's a problem. We find the root cause of that problem. We take corrective actions, implement countermeasures to make the root cause go away. And then for good improvement processes, we also throw in that, hey, we need to make sure that we take some sustaining steps to ensure that the problem does not come back in the future. And we do that by ensuring that the corrective actions stay in place. So what we wind up doing, whenever we're looking at the sustaining steps, the thought process here is, actually just backwards from what the problem solving flow is. The sustaining flow is that if we take good sustaining steps, the corrective actions, the countermeasures will remain in place. If the countermeasures remain in place, the root cause stays away. And if the root cause stays away, the problem doesn't come back and we get to keep the benefits of those corrective actions. And so you can see here that the problem solving flow and sustaining flow is actually just, just kind of the, the, the opposite of each other. Now, just to give you a, a few examples here, I've got a, an equipment problem, a process problem, and a personal problem. So we'll even take these, uh, these uh, principles to, uh, to our home, home life also, our personal lives also. Uh, you know, we run the Clorox bleach in many of our manufacturing sites, so we're going to have the example of having bottle jams while they're running down a, a packaging line. We're going to have another example of a process problem where it's taking too much time to create a report. You know, we're, we're having to wait on information, and it's just taking a lot longer just to generate this, this, uh, this report than what we really want it to. And lastly, we got a, a common one that a lot of people work on is, is being overweight from a, a personal standpoint. So the first example was this, this equipment example, this, this problem where we've got bottles that are going down this conveyor belt and they're jamming, they're stopping. Uh, the conveyor belt is still running, but something's happened to the bottle and it is no longer moving down that conveyor belt. It stopped it at point X on the conveyor, on the conveyor belt. If you think through this, this problem-solving 
process. You have the problem, then you find the root cause. Okay, the root cause in this case, we'll say the, the right side rail has been set in too far. The countermeasure that we took, the countermeasure being the thing that uh, that we do, that when we do it, the, the problem goes away immediately. Well, we set that rail back into the, the correct position where it's supposed to be. Once you do that, the bottles are able to, to flow down the line. So how do you make sure that that rail is always going to be set in the correct position? Well, one thing you could do as a sustaining step is to weld that rail in place. Make sure that way the, the rail cannot move uh, and cause the bottles to jam in the future. So then if you think back, hey, if, that, if that rail is welded in place, they can put backwards in the sustaining process. If that, if that rail is welded in place, it's always going to be in the correct position. It's never going to be set in too far, and the bottles are no longer going to jam at that point X any longer. The process example, we're saying that uh, this, this report generation takes five days, and that's just too long. It's just a report. It shouldn't take that long to, to generate a report, this, this, this particular report. The root cause of that, or one root cause, is that we're waiting for three days for information from Department X. So a lot of waiting time for that report to, to be generated. The countermeasure to that was, okay, we're going to just inform Department X three days earlier that, that we need this information from them. It's not that they can't get it to us. It's just that they need a heads up in order to, to make sure that they get it to us in the, by the time that we need it. So if that's the countermeasure, we need to inform them three to at a certain dot on a certain day. Well, the sustaining step: How do I make sure that I always inform Department X on the specific day? Well, I need to put on some kind of reminder to do that communication. I need to set a reminder to myself, put something on the calendar, have an app that, that pings me about it, so that I remember to do that. Otherwise, you're, you're relying on a person to remember to do a task. And that's not always uh, always the, the best thing to do because we all have other things that can distract us easily, and it's real easy for people not to remember to do certain things. And lastly, the, the personal example. Uh, just let's say the problem here is that, okay, I weigh two, 25 pounds too much. I'm, I'm 25 pounds overweight, so I, I want to start working on that. So one root cause there is that, well, I don't know how much uh, food I'm taking into my body. I don't know how many calories I'm consuming on a daily basis. So the countermeasure we take is that we're going to track food consumption in an app called MyFitnessPal. That's something that, uh, that I use on a regular basis. MyFitnessPal. It's where you record your food, and it keeps track of how many calories that, uh, that you've eaten uh, each day. And so for me to remember to track my food consumption in my fitness pal, I took some, some sustaining steps. And so I have another app called To Do, which is a task list, uh, a reminder for tasks that need to be done either on a daily basis or even on a one-off. So I set reminders in To Do and also on my calendar to remind me to go and enter in the food that uh, I've consumed into that app so that I know how much I've taken into my body. So if the sustaining steps are in place, if I'm, if I'm getting reminded to do it, and then I am doing it, uh, entering that into my fitness pal, then my unknown calorie consumption doesn't come back. And hopefully that's one of those steps that leads me towards improving that 25-pound uh, overweight problem. So basically what we're saying here is that rather than focusing on the output when we're talking about sustaining, our focus should really be moved from that output to the input and the process that is generating the output. So whenever we talk about the sustaining steps, we've seen a handful of them in the few examples that we were just talking. You know, there's any number of different types of sustaining steps that you might be taking. And so in order to help think through which are the most effective of those sustaining steps, I came up uh, for usage within, within Clorox a, a bad, good, better, and best uh, mentality, a thought process, a hierarchy 
for those, those different types of, of sustaining steps. And we'll go through some examples of, of each of these and also describe what, why I put some of them into the categories that I put them into. So going through this hierarchy, we start with the bad. So if sustaining action is bad, the problem of the root cause is definitely going to be coming back and you're having little to no impact on the, uh, the problem itself. So in order to be categorized in the bad category, these had to be had to be true. And so bad sustaining actions would include doing nothing. You know, that one hopefully is, is obvious, that if you don't do anything, you're almost assured that the person is going to take that rail off the machine or that the person is going to go back to the old way of changing that roll of plastic. I also uh, put in here informal word of mouth communications. Well, communication, that's supposed to be a good thing, right? Uh, the, the real key factor here is informal informal word of mouth. So if you go out to a line or go to a person who performs a, a service or, or does a process and tell them once about this change you want them to do, you know, how likely is that to be truly implemented and truly sustained for the long haul? Probably not very likely. Just as, a, as an example, I have uh, a clip uh, or a scene from the Andy Griffith show that I think is one of the funniest that uh, that I've actually seen. If you go into YouTube, you can actually find it. It's uh, it's called Horatio the Half a Boy. And if you're not familiar with the Andy Griffith show, uh, it stars Andy Taylor. He plays, uh, it stars Andy Griffith and he plays Andy Taylor. Andy Taylor is the sheriff of a small town in North Carolina and he is a widower raising his son, Opie. Opie is actually played by Ron Howard. He actually uh, directed the last, uh, the, the Solo movie, the Star Wars Solo movie that was out not, uh, not too long ago. But uh, Andy, the, the sheriff, is trying to raise his son, Opie. And the, the scene actually starts out with Andy finding out that Opie gave two cents to a, a local charity. It's the Underprivileged Children's Fund. And Andy is trying to convince Opie that he should have given more than just two cents to this worthy charity. So the scene starts out like this. Andy says to Opie, I was reading just the other day that there are 400 underprivileged children in this county alone, or one and a half boys per square mile. Opie says, I never seen one, Paul. Andy asks, seen what? A half a boy. Andy replies, well, it's not really a half a boy. It's a ratio. Horatio who? Andy says, not Horatio, a ratio. It's mathematics, arithmetic. Getting flustered, he said, forget that part of it. Forget the part about the half a boy. Well, it's pretty hard to forget a thing like that, Paul. Andy says, we'll try. Opie says, poor Horatio. Now look, Horatio's not the only needy boy in the, in the, 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 the communication kind of spirals out of control from there. And so hopefully you can see that whenever you tell somebody something informally, just word of mouth, depending on the words you use, depending on how they interpret those words, depending on any things that they mishear or misinterpret, you can have some actual bad communications that, that, that come from it. So the moral of the story, one time word of mouth communications are oftentimes ineffective. It's very much like the old telephone game. If you've ever played that where you have one person tells the next person something, that person whispers it to another, that person whispers it to another, and by the time it goes through a large string of people, what the last person hears is oftentimes something entirely different than what the first person said. So those word of mouth communications are not effective. So can't you imagine that happening? You tell one person on uh, one shift that you want them to do a new procedure. 
That person is supposed to tell another person. That person's supposed to tell the person on the next shift. That person's supposed to tell the person on the next shift. How can that message be mutated over the course of those few communications? And that mutation can actually be quite large. So that's why those one-time word of mouth communications are, are oftentimes uh, ineffective. So that was the bad side. That was the bad. Those one-time communications and doing nothing. Those are the bad side. Now we move on to the good. For something to be considered good, the problem is probably uh, the problem will come back, but we're trying to minimize the impact on that problem when it does happen to come back. So we're saying that we're not we're not saying it's impossible for a problem to come back, but we're just trying to make uh, make it easier for us to react to it when the problem does come back. So some some of the examples here of good sustaining actions, including monitoring the output metric, or monitoring that output quality, uh, installing redundant systems so that when one fails, you can route around it to this redundant system. Uh, having troubleshooting guides that people can refer to when an issue pops up. And then I also put training and qualification here into the, the good sustaining action uh, category as well. I want to focus on the first three here, uh, here initially. Monitoring output metrics allows you to see the problem when it comes back. The redundancy installation allows you to divert around a problem once it's come back. Troubleshooting guides allow you to find root causes and deal with those root causes more quickly once the problem comes back. So the reason these are just in the good category is that for these to be effective, the problem has had to have come back in the first place. Ultimately, we'd love it if the problem didn't come back at all. But in the event that it does, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that we are monitoring output metrics, we've got some redundancy installed, or we've, we've got some sort of troubleshooting guide to allow us to, to react to that problem. Now, if you remember, the other thing in the good category was training. Now, typically you think training, that's a great thing. We want to train our people, and, and that is true. The problem with training, though, is that it relies on people. And can you always count on people to remember exactly how to do things? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is, is no. You know, we all have 20 different things that are going on. We have personal problems. We have a work problem. We have financial problems. All these things that are distracting us from doing things uh, potentially correctly uh, as, we, as we would want to at, when we're at, uh, at work, when we're doing the services or running the equipment that, uh, that we want to. Additionally, if you are in a training and qualification role, I'll be quite frank in that I do not envy you your position because it is really a large resource drain to ensure that everybody does the proper procedures correctly, continually. You have to train new people. You have to retrain people who have been there for a while. You have to audit to ensure that the procedures are being done correctly, and you have to react if they're not. So. It's just a, a large, a large resource drain. And when you have people who have been around for a while doing certain certain roles and you want to make an innovation, you want to make a change, that person has to unlearn what they've already learned in order for them to be able to do it in that in that new way. So training again is a good thing, but it's not optimal. It's not in that better or best category. It's just in the, the good category because it relies on people who don't always remember, and it can be a really large resource drain to truly sustain how people do tasks. So moving on to the better category, the better category to be categorized here, uh, the problem might come back in the future, but we're trying to limit the probability that it will. We're trying to minimize the potential that that root cause is going to come back, that the countermeasures are going to go away. Uh, we're trying to minimize that probability. So some of the better sustaining actions would include in-process metrics. You remember in the, the good category, we had output metrics that we mentioned. Here we're talking about in-process metrics so that we know before they go haywire if things are starting to trend in a bad way. 
uh, input audits and inspections. So if you think about the inputs to a process, are we checking to make sure that the raw materials, the packaging materials, uh, are meeting the specs so that the process will run like we, like we want it to? Uh, task reminders for people. We said training was good. Task reminders are better. That way we help people remember to do certain things on a set frequency. Uh, similar to that are check sheets or checklists because these, again, give a person a reference that they can go to to help ensure that they do things in the, the correct fashion. And then lastly are visual controls, which are right there at the point where a problem can happen and, you, and make it evident whether things are right or wrong. And we'll hit some examples of, of these uh, now. Whenever we talked about uh, task reminders, uh, we want to help people to remember to do certain things. On the left-hand side there is actually one of our clean and inspect and lube standards. I think this is just the, the clean section of it for one of our pieces of equipment uh, within, uh, within Clorox. And what that does is that's a reminder for the, the operators to do certain tasks on a shiftly, daily, weekly, or monthly basis. So this is just that reminder that they go to and says, oh, I need to do this, this, and this today. This way, the machines are maintained. And when the machines are maintained, the root causes of problems don't come back, and we don't have to suffer through those, those problems. Those, so this is part of our autonomous maintenance work that goes on within, uh, within Clorox. But this is a sustaining tool to help ensure, ensure that people are doing things uh, consistently and correctly. On the right-hand side is that app, that to-do app that I mentioned earlier that I use for my own uh, personal health and other tasks. And so from a personal standpoint, uh, this is the, uh, the healthy side. And I get pinged with, uh, uh, with reminders to do certain things like recording my food. And I try to remember to do uh, the things that are listed there just from a, a health, uh, health standpoint. Uh, now, this is not the only way I use it. I use it for, you know, work-related projects uh, and things also just to keep things moving. But it also gives you red, those red badges on the, uh, the app icon on the phone so you know, wow, this is, a, uh, this is a visual indicator that I've got something I still have to do today. So, again, very handy to help you remember to do certain things and to knock out certain tasks on a, a certain frequency because you can't always remember things yourself because of all the other distractions that, uh, that are happening. And then also here in this better category were visual controls. Things like labels, coloring, lights, and outlines are all visual indicators of what right and wrong should be. Visual controls are what make right and wrong obvious at a glance. So whenever a person is walking by a piece of equipment and things are all in the green, gauges are all in the green, you know, that's a thumbs up. That's everything is good. Everything is running as it should be. But if things are running out of green, you know, if they're moving into the yellow or the red section, then, wow, that's a, that's an indicator. Wow, I need to react. I need to take some kind of action to ensure that things don't go off kilter and that things, uh, and that we don't have to deal with problems like off quality or inefficiencies. Now, that particular stoplight there is a, a visual control also. Now, that particular one is not a good visual control, <laughs> but it is a, a visual control. That is a real stoplight, by the way, as, as I understand it. And it's, uh, it, it's a difficult one because, you know, you can overdo visual controls. It's possible that you do too much and make it so that a person uh, – is not going to be effective at being able to tell what's right and wrong. Like if I come up to that, I'm not going to know if I'm supposed to go or slow down or, or stop just because it's so noisy, so visually noisy that it's impossible to tell. Uh, so got to be careful with the visual controls. You don't want to overdo it. Bad visual controls would also include uh, like, like uh, what I'm showing you here. Uh, I order, I need an extension cord, so I ordered one from Amazon and I received it. And when I unwound it, I needed to find a little bit of information about it to know what kind of uh, items I could plug into it. And I got to looking at how many labels were there. And labeling is a, a type of visual control. There were eight tiny labels on this particular cord at this one end. And then I looked at the other end, there were two more. So there were 10 of these tiny labels, only one of which really had any information that, uh, that I particularly needed. 
And so how likely is it that a person is to go through and read all those and find the information that's actually important to them or the, the information that's important for them to safely use that extension report? I think you may have seen that also in on ladders uh, where you have all these labels up and down the side of a ladder. And unfortunately, when you have too many, that kind of washes out the, those that are truly important. So be careful and only uh, do that for the, the important stuff because you risk overdoing it. Here are some good visual controls. On the right-hand side, you'll see where our chains are measured for the amount of, of stretch that they have. The one on the, uh, the top has stretched enough so it's starting to get into the red, and then that is an indicator that we need to put a, a new chain on or take out a link from it. Uh, and so when you do that, then it goes back into the green and it's able to run. And you can even see on that gear on the right-hand side, the direction, it's another visual indicator, uh, the direction that those sprockets are supposed to be turning. On the left-hand side, you can see one of the gauges there. That's in the green. It even lists out the 15 to 30 range that the green indicator is showing. So if an operator walks by that, they can see that and know that, well, it's good. Or if it's outside that green area, hey, I need to look at that and figure out what's going on. And then lastly, the, the good visual indicator down there is the gas gauge in our, our cars. You know, that's a visual indicator of how much gas so that you don't run out. But what I like even more on this is this little green triangle pointing to the left here uh, of the, uh, the actual gas pump itself. And that was something I didn't know what it was initially. Renting cars and having to travel for work like I do, I started to notice that, wow, that little triangle is actually indicating which side of the car that the gas cap is located. So whenever I'm pulling in my rental car that I'm not familiar with, to get gas for the first time, all I have to do is glimpse down there to know which side of the gas pump that I need to pull onto. Because there were a number of times in the past that I would pull in and then would have to back out and then pull back around to the other side, which wasted some of my time. And so that's just a quick visual indicator. Just that one drop of ink really helped in, in solving that problem of pulling into the wrong side. Now, lastly, we've come to the, the best category. Uh, the best category is where the problem cannot come back. This is where we're going to get the maximum benefit. And whenever we talk about the best here, we got to talk about Pokey Yoke. We, this is true error proofing, making problems impossible. Going back to a gas pump example, uh, I don't know if you've ever had diesel fuel uh, pumped into your car, but if that happens, uh, you're in a world of hurt. So the, 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 the pump on the left-hand side that's green in color, this is actually a diesel pump. And the one on the, uh, the right, this is a regular gas pump like what you put into a, a car. So after, I'm sure, a few cars got contaminated with diesel fuel, they actually went back and have air-proofed this process. So it's a little difficult to tell, but this diesel nozzle is actually larger than the nozzle for pumping regular gasoline. So that this, the larger diesel nozzle will not fit into your typical car. So it makes it error-proofed, makes it virtually impossible for a person to intentionally pump diesel fuel or unintentionally pump diesel fuel into their car. That's what we're talking about with, the, with true error-proofing. How can you make it so it is impossible to do it in an incorrect fashion. And an interesting way that I've found to train on physical air proofing as well as other sustaining steps is actually the mousetrap game that was that's uh, produced by, uh, by Hasbro. If you've ever played the mousetrap game, it's basically what you call a Rube Goldberg machine where there's a lot of moving parts. And so over the course of a training session, we actually use the mousetrap game as our piece of equipment for the, the training. And what the mousetrap game has is a lot of great examples, great and simple examples to train on sustaining steps. They have visual indicators on the board as to where certain parts go. They also, from an, a true error proofing, a true polka yoke standpoint, they also have parts that fit together, but they fit together in only one specific way because they have a specific shape hole, like a D-shaped hole, 
and a D-shaped peg that fits into it. Now, if it were a round peg in a round hole, that part could rotate around freely. But with a D-shaped peg in a D-shaped hole, there's only one specific way that that part will fit into it. And so they've made it so that it's airproof. When you put those two parts together, it's always going to be facing the direction that it's supposed to be facing. So if you've not taken a look at this uh, this game, look at it with the eye for how they've sustained it or for how they've airproofed the, the assembly. And I think you might look at it in, a, in an entirely new light. Uh, so that was more equipment airproofing. There's also some procedural airproofing that could take place. So if you've got computer and electronic systems, that's a, a, a real a good way to airproof some procedures. So if you've got autocorrect, autofill, entry checks on uh, uh, cells that you're entering things into on like an Excel spreadsheet, you know, that helps make sure that data being entered in is is correct. Uh, there's also cameras and motion detectors and things like that that uh, can help uh, detect if a person has done a procedure in the, the correct way also. So going back to the bad, good, better, and best hierarchy, if you remember back to the uh, the bottles going down the line who were that were uh, jamming up, it would be bad for the person who put the rail back in the correct position just to go and tell a couple of people on the line. You know, maybe they remember to tell the people on the other shifts, maybe they don't, and the information that, that they do relay, if they do relay it, maybe it's not going to be exactly what, uh, what they were told. Some good sustaining steps for that process, though, would be to add this jam to the troubleshooting guide and to train on that adjustment point and what that uh, adjustment point means. So the troubleshooting guide they can refer back to whenever the jam happens and whenever the uh, uh, the people who are trained on it, they are going to be more familiar with the importance of that adjustment point to the bottles being able to flow down the line. A better way is to add visual indicators to show where that rail should be set. That way, if you're looking down the row there and all the rails are set to the green level, then hey, you're, you're good and I don't have to worry about it. But if they've moved off of that green mark, then hey, that, that should be a, a red flag that hey, Things need to be, things could be going wrong here. I need to move things back to where they're, they're supposed to be. And then lastly, this was the one that we used in the example we described it before. Hey, let's weld that rail in place so that it cannot move. Uh, if, move if that rail moving is really a problem, then hey, let's make it so it cannot move at all. Now, the, the truth is that within Clorox, we run different bleach bottle sizes. So welding rails in place is not always an option. So many times we have to run back to the better section. So if you can't do the best, it's okay to go back to the, the better section and add those visual indicators. And we will add visual indicators for each different size bottle so that the rail is always set to the correct level for the right size bottle. So you might have a large bottle that's set uh, to a green color, uh, a, a medium sized bottle that's set to a blue color. And as long as it's all blue, then those bleach bottles will, will be running down the line uh, correctly. So as you're trying to select the best sustaining steps, uh, I would encourage you to ask some, some certain questions and try to determine, hey, what are, what are the specific things that I should be doing in order to make sure that that change, that countermeasure is going to stay in place? This is just a, a quick example of some of the questions that uh, you might have, that you might ask. Now, I, it, there's not one set of specific questions that you can't ask. It's really going to depend on what types of sustaining systems you have within your plant or within your group uh, already. What sorts of team training and qualification documents do you have? Do you have need of physical airproofing? And depending on the specific situation, there should be triggers that tell you, okay, this needs to go to a, uh, a troubleshooting guide. Or, hey, we can weld that, that rail in place to make a physical airproofing of that, of that change. So the last thing to really hit on here uh, just has to do with analyzing uh, your plan. So whenever you make a change, whenever you come up with that, that new innovation, you should be looking at the, the sustaining steps that you're putting into place. And if your sustaining steps, sustaining steps are primarily focused on the output, monitoring that output metric, waiting for things to go wrong, or if it's dealing primarily with the people side of things, 
then that's going to be much less effective as a sustainment plan as something like this would. If you're implementing some visual controls within the process and monitoring in-process metrics, those are going to be much more impactful than the previous example where everything was on the output and the people. And then lastly, if you can error-proof something and make it impossible, you can actually save yourself some work because you're going to have to take fewer actions in your sustainment plan. You don't have to train people on as much. You don't have to monitor the output as much if you were truly able to lock down your countermeasure to ensure that it cannot change going into the future. And one other thing, uh, up to now we've been talking about uh, things that you do after you've implemented a countermeasure and you try to lock it down. Before you implement a countermeasure, there's a handful of things that you should consider also. Uh, you do need to think through those unintended consequences. Are there things that this change that you're making might cause, other problems that this change might cause that would make the person using the process want to take it out? Uh, that's one of those triggers for a person whenever they, they have a new problem and you've installed this new new rail, hey, maybe that new rail was the trigger for this new problem. Even though it solved the, the other problem, maybe this new problem was, was being caused by the rail. So let's yank that rail off. So consider those unintended consequences so that you can hit those off. Obtain feedback from the actual users of the process or of the equipment to make sure that there isn't anything going on that you're not aware of. And then lastly, if you can obtain leadership buy-in, they are more likely to support you by asking the questions about those specific countermeasures uh, in the future also. So to me, there is no sadder waste than having to resolve a problem again and again uh, in the future. So what I really want you to take away from here is to choose the sustaining actions based on the, the type of change that you have, but prioritize them so that you can choose the most impactful using that bad, good, good, or best mentality. Move to the best as far as you can, and you will be able to save yourself extra effort and ensure that your company is able to enjoy the benefits of those countermeasures being locked down uh, for a long time to come. And then lastly, gauge the health of that plan. Uh, you can do those X's on that on that chart to see, hey, where are we putting most of our effort and see if there's uh, some better efforts that you could put more inside the process or more inside the, uh, of the inputs to that process to ensure that uh, they can get locked down rather than focusing on waiting for the problem to come back by focusing on the, the output metric. So that is the, uh, the sustainment uh, question that, uh, that came up to us. Uh, we had been focusing on too many of the wrong questions, too many of the general uh, how do we sustain the input or how do we sustain the uh, the output, how do we sustain the result, how do we sustain the change, and not as much emphasis was being put on how do we sustain the countermeasures. Uh, thank you very much again, Sean, for your presentation. We have only two minutes, so you can post your questions in the question and, a question and answer section of the WebEx tool. And I should remind you that you can find the recording of this webinar on ASQ Innovation Division YouTube channel. So one question I've got that is the bad sustaining action is the act of informal communication. Uh, would that be like the formal um, communication we considered as a, a good or uh, maybe better sustaining action? A, a, a more formal communication plan would be closer to the AT and Q. Uh, closer to a training and qualification side. I consider that more of a formal communication where I'm going out and retraining somebody on a particular process. So a formal communication would be closer, more akin in the in the good in the good category, close to a training and qualification. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. So if there is no questions, uh, 
we can end this uh, webinar event. Uh, thank you very much again, Shine, for your presentation. And thank you all again for joining this webinar. And have a good night. Hey, thank you, Al. You'll have a great night.